Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Hans. I'm Nico. We work on Chromium, the open source project behind the Google Chrome web browser. Uh, and Chromium loves LLV LLVM. Uh, we use Clang as both the default compiler on uh, Mac OS X and on Linux. Um, and we've been using Clang not as a default compiler back then since a long time, since before it could parse C++ more or less. Um, so you can look at that talk from 2011 if you're interested in the history here. And because we've been using Clang so long, we actually have a process where we track um, Clang trunk for building, because back then template support was added and whatnot, so we needed to pick that up quickly. And that ended up working really well, and so we still do this. Um, Okay, so, so this is how we do it. Uh, we start off with uh, trunk LVM, and then uh, 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 then every couple of weeks, uh, we build a package. We sort of take a, a revision from trunk and we bless it. We build a package and we push that to all our developers and all the build bots. Uh, and then within a day or so, uh, that's gonna end up in our nightly Chrome build uh, and produce what we call a canary that we ship to users who like to live on the really bleeding edge. So if you land a change to LVM uh, with the right timing, uh, within a day or so, uh, it, this might end up in the form of a web browser uh, in the hands of real users. And, and within about three months, uh, uh, we will graduate that release to, to the Chrome stable release and ship that uh, to millions uh, of users, uh, at least on Mac and Linux. Um, yeah, and shipping... Uh your production software with a trunk compiler is a bit scary, at least in, if you do client-side development. I think for server guys, that's fairly normal. Um, and this works because uh, Chrome has lots and lots and lots of unit tests, and LVM has lots of tests, and LVM is generally fairly high quality. Uh, so that uh, works really well, so thank you for, for that. And doing this gives us uh, many benefits. So we never have to work around compiler bugs because we can just fix the compiler bug and then deploy a new compiler. Uh, if someone writes a bug that they feel, like someone working on Chrome writes a Chrome bug that they feel the compiler should have caught, then they can just tell us and we'll implement a warning that uh, finds this bug at compile time so it'll never ever happen again, like either in Chrome or in any other project using Clang. And we quickly get access to new compiler tech, like the, all the sanitizer improvements, um, backend optimizations you're doing and whatnot. So since it's, uh, it's working so well, uh, we figured it'd be nice if this also worked on Windows. Uh, because Windows is where most of our desktop users are, at least. So some years ago, uh, we filed this bug to investigate using Clang on Windows, uh, and it turns out that the Microsoft support in Clang wasn't quite there back then. Um, so we had to work on both uh, the Chrome code base and the Clang code base, and after contributing thousands of patches to both code bases, uh, we kind of have things working. And by we, uh, and don't just mean like Hans and uh, Reed and David and I, uh, but the wider LVM community. There's been about 20 people, I would say, who have been actively working on uh, Windows support and Clang over the years. And so one thing we learned during the Mac and Linux things is that uh, incremental rollout is extremely important. Um, so we currently use the Windows SDK to build Chrome on Windows, and we want to keep using that, so we want to link against the Visual Studio libraries. Uh, we don't want to change our build system. We want to keep using like all the compiler flags we currently use on Windows, which are the Visual Studio compiler style flags with slash gr to, I think, disable rtdi, slash arch, and whatnot. Um, and at least for development, we also want to keep using the linker we currently use, which, which is a Visual Studio's linker. We don't want to use different debuggers, at least for development. Ideally, we just swap out the, the compiler, um, and we do this like on one bot, and all the normal bots keep building with uh, the normal Visual Studio compiler, and then we work on, on Clang CL. Um, so, and so for this, it's important that um, Clang kind of understands all these Visual Studio compiler flags. Right, so that's the, the first sort of problem uh, we run into. Uh, is that if, you, if we try to just swap out CL for Clang in our build, uh, CL uses different flags, right? So CL will, uh, uh, Clang will say that it doesn't understand what you're talking about, uh, like this. Uh, so we, we wrote Clang CL, which is sort of a different uh, command line inf interface for Clang, which understands these flags and passes them along to the internal uh, Clang machinery uh, so that we can use it as sort of a drop-in replacement in a, in a build system that's already using uh, Visual Studio. 
And a very special flag that's part of that is the slash fallback flag. <clears throat> so, so this can be used for incremental rollout. Uh, the idea is that if Clang sees something that it doesn't understand, uh, like exception handling uh, until very recently, uh, then the fallback will make it, okay, it's errors on the exception handling, uh, but then it can fall back to Visual Studio and compile that file anyway. Uh, so this allows us to sort of, we try to build everything with Clang, and then for the things that we don't succeed, we fall back. Uh, and that also gives us a sort of a number that's, that's nice to track. So we, we kept count of the number of translation units where we fall back, and then we work towards uh, driving that number to zero. And that's actually kind of what kept us fairly busy during the last year. So last year, if you've been here, uh, Reed already demoed like a kind of working Chrome built with Clang. Um, but back then, that fell back to CL for a bunch of translation units. And over the last year, we've been working on getting our fallbacks to zero, which means Clang CL needs to be able to compile every single feature used in any Chrome translation unit, which includes many of Microsoft headers. Um, and we had the first fallback free built on 64-bit, I think, in February, and then it took another four months to like, be completely fallback free in all the configurations that we support, 64-bit, 32-bit uh, with uh, static libraries, shared libraries, and address sanitizer and whatnot. So one consequence of fallback is that um, some translation units end up being compiled by Clang and some by the Microsoft compiler, and they need to be able to talk to each other and link together, and that's, uh, so they need to be binary compatible. This, of course, also needed to link system libraries. And so if you, ooh, um, so if you, uh, sorry, technology. Um, so if you work on um, mostly Itanium, uh, you'll think, well, C++ just gets compiled to x86 assembly. Uh, that should be fairly easy. But it turns out that uh, Microsoft or Windows uses a different uh, ABI or binary interface uh, than any other platform, more or less. So if you look at the snippet of code on the left, there's a struct with a virtual function, an int field, uh, a double field, and then the virtual function just returns the int field. So um, in the middle, you see the output of Clang or GCC on Mac or Linux. Um, on the right, you see the same, like the output of the Visual Studio compiler on Windows. And if you can read assembly a little bit, you'll see that the, the names are different of the two functions. Um, the calling convention is different. In the middle, the, this pointer gets passed on the stack. On the right, it gets passed in ECX. And the struct layout is also different. In the middle, the offset of X is four from this pointer. And on the right, it's eight, which is a little surprising if you think about it. Um, right. Okay, so we had to teach uh, Clang about uh, mangling, struct layout, RTTI, all these ABI things. And I don't want to talk about this uh, too much uh, because we already talked about this a bunch in the past. So you can check out these two slides, uh, these two talks down there um, by Reed two years ago and by David one year ago. Uh, one thing I do want to say is that, as far as I know, in the last decade, there has been no new uh, commercial compiler that implements the Windows ABI, and there has never been any open source compiler that implements the Microsoft ABI, so as far as I, as far as I know, which kind of hints at that this is a, a non-trivial problem, and that's mostly completely solved in Clang now, so that's cool. Um, so what we do want to talk about is the, the front end part of this a little bit. Right, so, so uh, Clang is very nice in that it's, uh, it's a nice, good, and standard conformant C++ compiler, uh, but we do need to parse uh, and handle and compile all the, the header files for the libraries we need to use. So that's sort of the, the goal uh, on the front end side. We want to be able to parse those headers uh, while otherwise being standard conformant. Uh, and those headers are, of course, still in C++, uh, but Bjorn's book or the standard doesn't really tell the, the full story. Uh, in practice, it turns out that the language is, is uh, defined by the code that's out there and, and written. Uh, so we have to be able to deal with that. Uh, and system headers are kind of special uh, because we can't fix them, right? The compiler has to deal. Uh, it's also not useful to warn about things in system headers, uh, again, because we can't fix them. Uh, so we want to be strict about code, which, uh, which can be changed, but for the system headers, we, we don't. Uh, so we need a, a way to mark uh, system headers as special. And the way this works in Clang uh, usually is with the dash i system uh, flag. And the way that translates into, into Clang CL is that it looks at the, for the include environment variable that's set up by Visual Studio environments. And we treat those directories as uh, dash i system directories. Uh, and uh, MSVC doesn't have this concept, which, is, uh, which can be problematic. It means that some warnings can't, can't be turned, off, turned on if they, if they occur in a system header because they would fire there and, and be noisy. 
so, so again, the goal is to be able to process these headers while being uh, otherwise standards conformant. Uh, and the way we do this is that we, uh, we allow all the Microsoft extensions that we, that, we, that we need to do to be able to compile the code, uh, but we warn about those extensions when they're used. And then we suppress all the warnings uh, that occur in system headers, uh, but you will see them in your own code. And if you want to, you can, of course, turn this on uh, with dash W system headers uh, and fix the warnings. Great. So let's look at a few uh, actual examples of these language um, extensions. Um, so we're focusing on things that C++ programmers can see, so semantic differences or whatnot. Uh, there are also many, like mostly internal things that we won't talk about here. Um, and I think each of, or most of these examples are kind of good to know if you write C++ code that is built on, on Windows. Um, but it's also each of these is something that someone had to teach uh, Clang CL. And this is a very non-exhaustive list, of course. Uh, so let's start with uh, the token pasting operator. So if you, you're not familiar with the token pasting operator, the two number signs in the first line uh, are the token pasting operator of the preprocessor. And if a macro is instantiated, what this does, it basically takes the thing on the left and to the right and mesh, uh, pastes it together into a single token without any space in between. So in this case, if you say my int foo, uh, then this becomes int my foo with my and foo pasted together. So with that cleared up, um, if you have a macro that is slash token paste slash, um, you might think, well, this should maybe form like a, a comment token. Um, but it turns out this is actually um, undefined behavior because the result of a token paste needs to be a so-called preprocessor token and a slash slash isn't one. Uh, so Clang and GCC uh, choose to error on this, um, and the Microsoft compiler chooses to form a slash slash operator, which is arguably fine since it's undefined behavior, so they can do what they want. So this is what uh, the, the code becomes to, to the Visual Studio compiler. And then they um, go on and ignore everything behind it as a comment, and this is, strictly speaking, not correct because the standard says uh, comment removal happens before preprocessing. Um, but this is something that system headers rely on, surprisingly. Um, so if you want, you can make your own uh, common thing if you use Clang CL. Okay, another example is a header lookup also works differently. Uh, let's say you have three files, uh, p.c, and the contents of that is just include p.h, and then you have p.h in a subdirectory called sub, and the contents of that is just include p1.h, and then you have p1.h at the top level again, and that's an empty file. So if you build this with um, Clang or GCC, with uh, dash i sub to add to the subdirectory to the search path, um, then it'll say, then it can find p.h because sub is in the search path, but it can't find p1.h because the, the current directory is not in the search path. Um, but with uh, Clang CL, um, or with uh, the Visual Studio compiler, every directory of every file in the current include stack is implicitly part of the search path. So in that case, uh, we are able to find p1.h and we tell you, well, this worked, uh, but it's not really portable. So if you want this, if you get this warning, you probably want to also add like a bunch of more directories explicitly to the search path. Or oh, we had one example in Chrome where we had two uh, directory structures that had the same subfolder structure and then one include from one folder uh, accidentally got picked up when we actually wanted the other one. In that case, we had to rename one of the folders, I think. So this is the, the general idea that uh, we accept, but we warn. The previous example, we don't warn on yet. Um, I think that's mostly an oversight because the previous thing was uh, implemented by Chris in 2010 when we didn't really have like a strategy for Microsoft extensions yet, so we should probably add the warning for the, the previous thing too. So templates is always a source of, of good fun. Uh, and what's uh, a big thing here is that the Visual Studio doesn't implement two-phase lookup. Uh, so the basic idea is that uh, yeah, names in table and templates should be looked up in two different phases. The idea is that you parse the template, you try to, to do lookups and, and uh, emit diagnostics, uh, except for names which are dependent on template parameters because you can't look them up uh, because they don't exist yet. So in this example, we have the template uh, and it's using the N name and that's dependent, so it's gonna be looked up later. Uh, but it's also using this A name, which is not type dependent and it doesn't exist yet uh, at the point that the template is declared, so that should be an error. Uh, but that's not how Microsoft does it. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, 
they do the parsing when the template is instantiated. So this code, uh, this code works for them. And, uh, and the way we do this in, in Clang CL is that we have this flag dash f delay template parsing, uh, which basically delays parsing of all the templates until the end of the translation unit. Uh, and that also means that unfortunately we can't warn here uh, uh, if the code end up, ends up working because we don't know if the code is working because, uh, because the template uh, parsing was delayed or if it would have, would have worked anyway. And we run into a bunch of sort of follow-up uh, issues with it. It, it. it turns out it's not just the bodies that need to be delayed, right? It can also be uh, default arguments to template parameters, like in this case, uh, where the foo, foo type is not, uh, is not defined yet uh, at the time that the template is declared. So we have to delay that as well. And in the, at this, for this one, we, we do have a warning. OK, this uh, somewhat surprisingly enums assigned uh, with the Microsoft compiler. And this is an example from, from this Monday, uh, where someone broke the Clang build, actually. So here we have an enum uh, that has a field SK captured region, which has the numeric value 3. And then we have a struct that has a bit field with two bits uh, of that enum. And two bits should be enough to store the numeric value two, uh, 3. But since it's a uh, assigned enum, it actually stores the values minus 2, minus 1, 0, and 1. So if you assign uh, SK captured region to that field, then one, uh, Clang CL um, thankfully warns you that uh, the number three is getting converted to the number minus one here. And that's, of course, bad if you then somewhere compare s.k to sk captured region because minus one is not equal to three. Um, and if you have a one-bit enumbit field, it stores zero and minus one. And also enums are also laid out differently. So if you looked at LVM's code, we like have lots and lots of enums where we I have like one bit for this bool, one bit for this enum, one bit for this bool, and we were very conscious about memory layout. But the Microsoft compiler does not merge uh, bit fields of different types. So if you have a one bit bool followed by one bit enum, that's not two bits, but that's two, two words in practice. So LVMs in memory representation is probably a lot less efficient on Windows than it is uh, on, on other platforms. Right, so pointers to member functions is another uh, fun corner of C++. Uh, so uh, pointers to members are, are different from other pointers. Uh, and that's because in multiple inheritance, uh, they need to have more information than just to which member they, they're pointing to. Uh, so in this example, for example, pointer or putter is pointing to the G method, but it also needs to keep track of the, the this adjustment that it needs to perform when the pointer is uh, applied to a U object. Uh, it needs to, uh, to perform an adjustment so that the G method uh, actually finds the, the object that it's part of, uh, because G is part of the, the T object. So on non-Windows, on non the pointers, the mem member pointers always have two fields, the, the thing that they're pointing to and the this, uh, the this adjustment. And you, that's why you can't convert such a pointer to, to regular pointers. But uh, MSVC uh, is flexible. Uh, they have another thing going on. So for single inheritance, for example, you just uh, need one field, really, because the, this adjustment is always going to be zero. So they like to use just one field. Uh, and if you're going to be flexible, uh, you can have more fields as well. So, so having all the fields allows you to handle very tricky situations, like uh, when you have virtual inheritance. Uh, and then you can do things which aren't actually required by C++. Uh, it's actually not allowed by C++, I guess you could say. Uh, but uh, MSVC can handle that. So that, that's, that's sort of an extension. Uh, but it turns out that this, uh, this, is, uh, this gets problematic when you have uh, incomplete types, right? So in this case, when S is just forward declared, you don't actually know if it's involved in multiple inheritance. Uh, so you don't know the size of the, the, the member pointer here. So that's a big problem. And the way they solve this uh, is they, they provide this battery of, of flags, pragmas, and modifiers uh, to handle the situation. And that means that we do have to handle the situation both in, in the ABI to make sure that the, the pointers get the right layout. And we also have to handle all these things that occur in the source, the, the pragmas and the, the modifiers and so on. Right, another thing that's uh, Microsoft specific is um, structured exception handling and uh, also how accept C++ exceptions work internally. And uh, David and Reed gave a talk about this earlier and there was a BOF about this earlier. So I won't talk too much about it. From a front-end perspective, there's a bunch of additional keywords, and then the try, and then the finally, and then the accept, and then the leave. So we need to build uh, AST nodes and whatnot. And since there's a finally, uh, you have the usual problems you have in all languages with a finally. 
what if you have funny uh, control flow in your finally. So for example, here we try to return two, and after that's done, we return four. So it's not really clear what that's supposed to mean. Or you could have this nested in a loop, and so you try to return two, and then you continue your loop. Or um, under a leaf would jump out of a containing uh, try block. So there's a few like front end features like warning on this, and CL also warns on this. This is more like a completeness thing, not a. Thankfully, no system header actually has finally blocks where they jump out of. Uh, this is just if uh, for completeness, I guess. So DLL export is another uh, thing that occurs both sort of as a source thing and at the binary level. Uh, the idea is basically if you put DLL export on a function, it's going to get exported. Uh, and this is pretty different from how you do shared libraries on, on Linux. Uh, the way you usually do this is that you put DLL export on all the things you need exported from your shared library. And then when you, uh, when you use the library, you mark these things with DLL import. Uh, and Clang already had support uh, for the basic things, like DLL exporting a function or a variable uh, worked great, uh, which is very nice. But then it starts getting more interesting uh, when you, you, we do it on a whole class. So the basic idea is that if you export a class, you basically export all the members. And that makes a lot of sense. And the, the, the sneaky thing is this includes stuff that you might not have declared yourself. So for example, if you have members that are non-pod non members, you might get a non-trivial uh, constructor or destructor uh, synthesized for you, and those will get exported as well. And then we always export the, the operator equals. Uh, and we think this is because uh, that's a function that you can take the address of. Uh, and the address needs to compare equal across all the places where you, uh, where you use this library. And then templates enter, enter the picture. <laughs> and it gets more interesting. So in, in this example, we have a, a straightforward template that's not exported or anything. Uh, and then we have a class that is exported and it inherits from a, a, a specialization of this template. Uh, so the members of S do get exported, of course, uh, but to a surprise, we also export the members of the template base class, which is something uh, we didn't uh, really expect, but that happens. And that was, that's interesting to, to do in Clang. And also, of course, we get all the, the operator equals. And then there's a long list of other decal specs. For example, you can use decal spec UUID to assign a unique identifier with any class, uh, assign this uh, identifier to a class. And then you can use under under UUID off to uh, retrieve that identifier and then do something with that identifier, which I guess is kind of neat. And it's used heavily in COM, so we support it. So if you feel like doing this, <laughs> knock yourself out. Um, then there's a no return which is that's what you expect. So you can say assert does not return because it crashes your process. And then if you call assert from a function that's supposed to return something and then you don't return anything that we then Clang CL won't warn because it knows assert is no return. This is very similar to the um, attribute uh, no return in GCC and Clang, but it's slightly weaker. Um, with a decal spec no return, you can't express a function pointer pointing to a no return function, while the GCC Clang spelling does allow that. Um, yeah, then. Uh, okay, so another decal spec is, is, uh, is select any, which allows you to, to define uh, a variable multiple times, and then the linker is going to, to pick one. Uh, so this is kind of the one definition rule uh, killer. And it allows you to do funny things like this, where you uh, you define a variable uh, in multiple translation units uh, with different values. In this case, it's going to get a different value depending on the time of day that you compile it. Uh, and the way this works is that all the definitions, they go into a, a special uh, comdat group, and then the linker, linker pink picks one entry in the group. Uh, and I think David and Raphael implemented support for this uh, in LLVM, which was a, a big thing. Then uh, inline assembly works fairly different on Visual Studio. Um, so on GCC, you have the G uh, asm, and then you pass a string in at and syntax. Uh, in Visual Studio, you say under under asm and open a block, and then you have a Intel assembly syntax. There's also a decal spec naked, uh, which means tells the compiler to not do any frame setup or te teardown for this function. And this is uh, from SQLite, uh, how they get the timestamp counter of the currently active core. And the under under asm support in uh, LVM is, like, if you go hunting for bugs, you'll probably find some. Uh, but in general, it mostly works and it's, it's there. So that's cool. OK, so, so Pragmas is another way to, uh, to access uh, compiler extensions. And MSVC has a, has a very long list of them. 
and we only implement a few, uh, I guess the ones we, we ran into really. Uh, pragma comment lib is a way to add a, a dependency on a library that sort of goes into your object file. So when the linker links your object file, it will pick it up from there. Uh, pragma pack is just to, to pack the struct layout. Uh, pragma intrinsic is a very important one that we haven't implemented, uh, which is a way to tell, tell, uh, tell the compiler about an intrinsic that you like to use. Uh, and if you do it, use intrinsics in your code uh, with Clang, you have, to, you have to include our intrin header. Uh, that's the way it usually works, right? You have to declare your intrinsics. Uh, so in Chromium, we, we force include the intrin.h to be able to use intrinsics. Uh, if exists is a, a fancy, a very fancy extension actually. It's kind of like uh, if def, so you can conditionally include or exclude code, uh, but it's not done by the preprocessor, so it can access uh, symbols. So in this example, uh, there's int, uh, you, we declare an, a symbol a, and then uh, we say if exists some symbol called a, then we print f that symbol as a, as a decimal integer. And so in this case, a, there is a symbol dot a, so this print f gets uh, executed. Now if you go ahead and just remove the, the int, then uh, the printf file, uh, printf line is never compiled, never seen by the compiler, more or less, because there's no symbol called a. And uh, you can think of uh, templates to see why this might be useful. So you can say, like, if exists dependent type, colon, colon, some variable, then you add a bunch of additional functions or something. Um, and this is also used by system headers. Um, was uh, fairly tricky to implement. I think Will Wilson implemented this, maybe. Yeah, and the, there's been a very long list of other things uh, in Clang uh, uh, or in, in that Clang needs to support. Like set jump apparently takes a handed secret parameter that I think Nico and David fixed, uh, which also means you can't uh, call it through a function pointer. Null can't be using this, this fancy special under under null object. It has to be zero, really. Uh, there's a long tail of intrinsics that we haven't implemented yet. Uh, we sort of find them as we go along. Uh, most recently, the, the E mol. Uh, link.exe slash incremental support is, is uh, very sneakily broken unless ClangCL provides a timestamp in the object files because apparently it relies on that. Uh, we've had to inject um, or interpose some system headers, uh, for example, VA devs to make uh, variadic uh, function calls work uh, and in types that age because the, the, the inter, in, interior type didn't match the, the, the macros for print conversion specifiers uh, and the no op and, and under, under super and, and so on and so forth. All right, so this gave you like an idea of how uh, Microsoft extensions look, and maybe you want to use some in your Windows-specific files. Um, so back, back to some like more administrative things, how our little project is set up. So there was a, a BOF yesterday in how it's like super hard to keep up with upstream LVM. Um, and it's kind of understandable how you get in that situation, right? You see if you can get something going with LVM, you hack up your local thing, and then it kind of works. So you upload that somewhere, and then you're the rest of the, your team kind of starts working on this, and before you know it, you have like a fairly sizable fork, and then you need to pull upstream every now and then. Uh, so our solution to this is um, to be upstream. <laughs> Don't fight upstream, be upstream. Um, and that probably doesn't work for everyone, but it works really well for us. So um, we do, do all our reviews on uh, fab.lvm.org. It's all, all development is done in the open. So if we do something incorrect, then other members of the LVM community can tell us that immediately instead of us running into that like one year later after we've built a huge house on this assumption. Um, so this works really well for us. Um, and if you remember, so this is how we like do our, our compiler um, builds. We also have builds that basically run build Chrome and audits test binaries with Clang trunk all the time continuously and then run all the tests and all the performance tests and whatnot. Um, so this allows us to find Clang regressions really, really quickly. Uh, so you've probably, or you might have seen uh, us complaining about you breaking somewhat, and people are usually like super responsive. Um, for the, the performance, if you're, if, you do, if you're doing some performance optimization and you're curious if this affects like real application level performance and not just benchmarks, uh, you, you could look at our performance graphs, like we have real-time performance graphs, and then look at the difference of the Clang trunk bot versus the like just Chrome bot just regular Chrome um, bot, because sometimes we improve performance too, or make it worse. Uh, so not every improvement is due to client changes, but that's kind of cool. So here's a, a recent example of a bug. Uh, bug itself is not important. 
Uh, but if you look at the timestamps, you'll see that uh, this got fixed in under 90 minutes, which I think uh, is amazing, and this is super common. So thank you for uh, keeping Trunk working. Um, yeah, so the LVM philosophy of Trunk should be production ready is uh, really critical for, for our setup to work. So thanks again for, for doing that. Right, so it seems that this, uh, this collaboration uh, is beneficial for both parties, uh, and it's kind of fun to think about this as a this kind of symbiotic uh, relationship. As it turns out, uh, Chromium is not just a great web browser, it's also an excellent C++ test suite. Uh, that's our experience, at least. And, and Clang, on the other hand, uh, it's not just a great compiler, it's good at uh, sort of keeping us straight about our C++ uh, with all the warnings and optimization works that goes in. So it's making sure we don't stray from the path of, of well-defined C++. Uh, and another very exciting thing is that it seems that other people is finding, uh, finding Clang CL useful as well. Uh, for example, we hear that Firefox has managed to build with it, uh, and they've contributed uh, a bunch of patches as well, which is very helpful. Uh, we also hear that Microsoft is using it uh, to build a hybrid compiler with Clang as a front end and, and their, their own back end, uh, which is extremely exciting. Uh, and they promised to contribute upstream, and, and it seems that we're starting to see this today uh, on the mailing list. There was an email earlier today, which is really cool. Uh, there's still a huge amount of work going on. So we've been focusing on correctness. We haven't really done a lot of uh, performance work. Uh, we want to look at binary size performance and build speed. Uh, there's ongoing work going on in exceptions. If you caught David and Reed's talk, uh, uh, they basically have everything working, but there still seems to be some, some uh, details to wrap up. And there's also the LVM linker, LLD, which we are uh, extremely excited about for, for both link speed, uh, open sourceness, and, uh, and then doing LTO with LVM uh, on Windows through this linker. Uh, there's also work needed for the debug story. We're working on an LDB on Windows, which is super exciting. And we're also curious to see uh, uh, what's going to happen with PDBs on Windows. Maybe we can use that uh, sort of in the meantime to get everything working. Uh, so summing up, uh, Clang is CL is, is, is uh, far from done yet, but it's really getting there, and it's at a very exciting stage now. So we can build Chrome on both 32-bit, 64-bit, all our different build configurations, not just the browser, but all the tests. We can get all the tests passing, uh, and we shipped one Chrome build last week uh, on Windows for reals, at least for a little while, and there weren't any major issues. Uh, so it's really, really getting there. Uh, that's basically our talk. Uh, we have a bunch of backup slides if you're interested, and some of those include more details about how to use Clang CL in your project. Uh, but we are out of time. Uh, if you want to, to look at these uh, or grab us in the, in the hallway, please do that. Yeah, or they'll also be paste, uh, posted to LVM. Yeah, the slides will weeks. be available, of course. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so we have about five minutes for questions. Hi. I'm uh, curious uh, if you have any experience with the current state of uh, building uh, Clang for Windows, if you actually, heaven forbid, want a POSIX environment. So uh, historically, you could configure with GCC and compile with Clang with GCC, and you would get essentially all the GCC headers, and you would get a POSIX environment. Do you have any experience with that currently? Or? Uh, on Windows, you mean? Like build using the Itanium ABI on Windows? Yeah. Uh, no, we haven't done this. We want to link to other Microsoft libraries, more or less, um, because else you kind of always trail their SDK. So we haven't really tried this. So were there, were there uh, Visual C++ features that you could actually ban from the uh, Chromium uh, code base, or were most of the things that you were seeing here also in the system headers, and so you had no hope of actually banning them? You mean the extensions? Uh, yes, just all the all the oddities of uh, Visual C, of uh, C plus plus on Microsoft platforms. Yeah, we we run into some stuff in in the Chromium source for sure, uh, and that and there we get the warnings, and they they're usually very useful. But but the bulk of the extension, I mean, we fix that code, uh, but the bulk of the extensions and the stuff that we run into is in, in library headers that we have to use and that we can't fix. Yeah, but we definitely fixed a bunch of C plus plus correctness issues in Chrome. Yeah. Other questions? So one more question. So um, could
could you have gotten around a lot of this stuff by doing transformations on the header files so that they got rid of Microsoft features that you turned out not to really need? Were there things that were there just because you know, Microsoft put them in 20 years ago, but they weren't really relevant to doing compilation? I mean, some of this is, um, so ATL, for example, uses like lots of templates and lots of these extensions, and we use ATL in a few places. And I guess we could like rewrite the system headers and then either do this at build time or um, require that um, that everyone patches them locally. That seems kind of awkward. So we, we didn't really try that. Like we, for, as Hans said, uh, Visual Studio doesn't have, really have uh, this concept of system headers. So if you want to turn on some cool Visual Studio warning, you're sometimes not able to because it also fires on system headers. And we really wanted to turn on a warning about unreachable code and that happened to fire on X3. So for this, we actually tried to patch that one single line in X3. And that turned out to be a huge, huge headache. So doing this for anything larger, I think, is uh, mostly infeasible. Yeah, uh, we, we have done it for, for tiny things, and there, there it's like sort of the last resort. Uh, the way we interpose some headers that was mentioned, like the, the vadefs.h and, and intypes, those are headers that we couldn't fix, and it's, it's not really an extension, it's just different. And there we, we interpose the header with our own, right? We like undef their definitions and put it in our own, and that's, I guess you could see that as a way of rewriting the header, but that's very painful. Uh, and also, like a lot, lot, a lot of this work was uh, getting the ABI code gen stuff right, and that would have been necessary anyway, I guess. Other questions? I think I'm going to sneak one in. Um, so, to be honest, I haven't been following this work much on the mailing list. Um, so, I'm curious: Are you using Clang only for? Compiling Chromium, or also are you also using, say, and enhancing the static analyzer features of Clang to analyze analyze the Chromium code base? So not yet. So we don't use any tooling, or we don't use much tooling yet. So uh, we're interested in event, uh, eventually using the static analyzer and using Clang Tidy and whatnot, but that's not set up yet. What we have done is uh, write a few like Chrome-specific tools to do large scale. For example, we, we have this uh, compiler plugin that adds Chromium-specific uh, warnings to, to the compiler. And one warning we wanted to add is to, like, if a function overwrites something, it must be marked overwrite. And so we wrote a little tool that basically, for every function that did overwrite something, added overwrite, so we could turn on that warning. So we used Clang's tooling that way a little bit. Um, but there's uh, a lot of more, more things we can do now that uh, Chrome basically passes with Clang. OK, cool. Uh, we have time for one more question, if anyone has one. Okay, well then let's thank our speakers.